and I'm going to say welcome to everybody. This is the first in the Jewish Council of North Central Florida educational lecture series that I hopefully you've seen some of this in, in little postcard form or email form or social media form, but we are going to be exploring starting today a lecture series with a couple of lectures between now and the end of May on called One Nation Under God, Religion's Impact on the United States. And we are really excited. We're gonna have different speakers. I'm gonna introduce our speaker for today. We're going to delve, even though we are the Jewish Council, we are going to be delving into topics that are not just about Jewish issues, more about religion and historic and political issues, like you will hear today with Armin's talk. Um, and we have another lecture in two weeks on the 15th with uh, Professor Ken Wald, and he will be speaking on the forefathers, America and religion, the forefathers, the colonists, and our Judeo-Christian roots. I will be putting some information into the chat, uh, including if you don't know our email, I'll put our email. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to us tomorrow. I'm not gonna check my work email after this tonight. Uh, I'm also going to include a link that will be uh, to resources, electronic resources after each lecture from our wonderful partners at the University of Florida Judaica Library. I think Rebecca Jefferson may, I know she signed up, so she may be on here. I have to thank a whole bunch of people. And I'm starting with Rebecca. The, we are partnering with the Judaica Library. We are partnering with the Center for Jewish Studies. And I have to thank our um, grant funder, Florida Humanities, which if you're not familiar with Florida Humanities, they are a wonderful organization. I worked with them in a previous life and they are just fabulous. They love funding community educational programs all over the state. And um, I applied for a grant and they said yes. And so that is why we are able to bring this to you and we are very, very happy about it. Uh, but for now, we're gonna get started. I will tell you, that at the end of this lecture, I am going to run a little poll um, about your thoughts, what you've learned. Uh, this is part of running a grant that the people that give you the funding, they like to know people's thoughts and reactions and comments. So uh, I will be running that at the end. It's anonymous. So please, I hope that you will take the time the minute to, uh, to answer the questions. A uh, little bit of housekeeping. At the end of this lecture, if we have some time and Armin would like to answer some questions, then uh, we request that you raise your hand. And if you don't know how to do that, if you go to participants, whether you're on a, a iPad, other, other device or computer screen, you go to participants, there's usually little thumbs up or hands or something. And there's a, one in right in the middle that says raise hand. I will not call on people that are just waving at me because I can't see all of you. I'm only seeing a few people at the bottom of my screen. If you don't wanna ask a question in person, but you'd like to put something in the chat, we can do that. Uh, if we don't have time and there are questions then perhaps Armin might wanna answer them and then I can email everybody uh, since I have your registration, we can do it that way. But for now, we're going to introduce the person of the hour. And uh, this is Professor Armin Langer. And he is a, he explain what a DAAD visiting professor, assistant professor at the Center for European Studies at the University of Florida. Provide, prior to joining the Center for European Studies, he was a visiting research scholar at Brandeis University's Schusterman Studies Center for Israel Studies in Waltham, my alma mater, a transatlantic partnership on memory and democracy fellow at the Center for German Studies at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville and worked for the Center for Jewish Ethics at the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College in Wincote, uh, Pennsylvania. He has a much longer bio, but among the resources that you will get as soon as I put the link into the chat is his full bio. So I encourage you to go to the link. And when I email you the recording of tonight's lecture, I will also include links to those resources. So Armin, with that, Professor Langer, welcome. Thank you for being with us and take it away. Thank you, Linda, for the introduction, and thank you, everybody, for having me and for the opportunity to uh, cover everything about the presidency and anti-Semitism in an hour. Uh, that will be my task for tonight, and I will do my best. Uh, let me just share my screen. Can you please nod if you can see a full screen of a slide? Okay, it's blue and everything. Okay, awesome. Glad to hear that. So I 
As you can hear from my accent, I was not born here. I was not raised here. I've been living in the US for the past four years. And one of, one of the advantages of uh, being a kind of an outsider is that uh, some that I guess I develop certain skepticism or certain forms of skepticism uh, against uh, mainstream notions of uh, Americanness and how Americans sometimes view themselves just by being not American or not being American. Um, now, I think that there is a very popular uh, narrative here in the US, uh, also a narrative uh, enforced and, and supported by our presidents or American presidents, which depicts the US as a haven for religious freedom, which depicts the US as a country which has always been welcoming to religious minorities, uh, which has always celebrated religious freedom. Um, I just selected more or less randomly two uh, statements from the current uh, Biden administration and another one from the previous Trump administration. Both of these statements, which you can see on the screen, uh, basically tell us that the, the country or the territory, which we know today as the United States, has been, um, as I said before, uh, always welcoming towards religious communities across the spectrum. Um, to quote the statement by the Biden administration, from the earliest days of our nation, courageous people from every part of the world have come to the United States in search of religious liberty. Uh, or to quote from the Trump administration statement, from its opening pages, the story of America has been rooted in the truth that all men and women are endowed with the right to follow their conscience. So despite all the differences in uh, the Biden administration between the Biden administration and the Trump administration, they seem to agree on something. America is a land where religious communities could had always had the right to worship freely and the opportunity to evolve as equal citizens. Now, that's exactly the narrative I would try to challenge today to make the image a bit more complicated. Uh, without denying the many advantages that religious minorities uh, enjoyed and have been, have been enjoying in the US for many, many generations. I want to complicate this story. And for this reason, I decided to select a few um, presidents and speak about their relationship with the Jewish community, uh, with some presidential nominees, and also some advisors to presidents. So we'll see that um, during this evening, we are gonna discuss some aspects of Jewish life uh, in America since the colonial times. And uh, my aim is to paint a more complex picture than just America being a haven for everybody. Um, we will actually start with the time when America was not the United States of America yet. We'll go back to the time of America as a British colony. Now, uh, it is true that the territory which we know today as the United States uh, has embraced uh, religious freedom and toleration since its beginnings, but that's actually not something that the American forefathers introduced. Uh, the, this territory, which is today the United States, has uh, practiced religious tolerance since the 1600s, over a century before the establishment of the United States. Um, one of the first countries or uh, states uh, in human history, actually, to embrace religious tolerance was the colony, the British colony of South Carolina which uh, openly endorsed religious tolerance already in the 1660s uh, in its founding document, which was known as a constitution. Um, some claim that that constitution by the British colony of South Carolina was actually inspired by the British philosopher John Locke. Um, I also want to point to the so-called Plantation Act of the British uh, colonial power which actually granted citizenship to anybody who was 
besides Catholics, who settled in the British colonies in America, uh, which was something unprecedented in the history of European Jews, of course, who did not uh, have a way towards citizenship in any of the European countries. And after the introduction of the so-called Plantation Act in 1740, many Jews actually moved to the British colonies in America because they uh, were attracted by this uh, offer to become citizens and to enjoy the privileges, privileges of a citizenship. Um, the Plantation Act also permitted Jews not to take a Christian oath during the naturalization ceremony. So as we can see, there are traces of religious freedom or religious tolerance, maybe, uh, as early as the 1600s in the territory which we call uh, United States today. Um, at the same time, I want to underline toleration does not mean equality. Uh, just because Jews and also other religious minorities like Quakers were tolerated in the British colonies, that doesn't mean that they were treated as equal uh, as equals. Um, the, English, the British colonies, of course, uh, had no separation of church and state. Uh, as you might know, England until today does not have a separation of church and state. Um, and the Church of England was the state church of the colonies, and only a few religious organizations were permitted to incorporate. And without incorporation, other religious communities were not permitted to own property, for instance. So it is for this reason that for the first time of Jewish presence in America, um, Jewish communities did not own uh, cemeteries, for instance. They did not own synagogues. Uh, the, the early Jewish communities were meeting in private properties and not in the communal uh, properties as it later became uh, the norm. Um, this changes with the dis disestablishment of the Church of, Church of England, uh, meaning with the first attempts to separate uh, church and state. The first American state to do so was New York, but then soon other American states followed suit. Um, meaning they opened the pathway to incorporation also to other religious communities, not only to the ones that the Church of England uh, permitted, but uh, basically to everybody, except for Catholics. <laughs> Catholics will come up a lot in this lecture, I'm sorry about that. Um, and Jews do take advantage of this situation. So we have the first Jewish communities in the late 1700s who go down the path of incorporation and become corporations, private corporations within civil society. But uh, I want to point to one of the first challenges that these early Jewish communities in the American Republic face, and that's namely the new community structure. Now, um, you know, these are good kinds of problems to have in comparison to the problems that Jews had back in Europe. But um, since our goal today is to paint a more complicated picture of Jewish presence and Jewish experiences in the United States, I want to point to some of the challenges that the whole incorporation process led to. Um, for instance, the incorporation laws in the early American Republic uh, require Jewish communities to establish boards of trustees. That is something that Jewish communities never had in the history of Judaism until this point, until uh, they were faced with these expectations and social pressure to go and become corporations. Uh, as soon as the Jewish communities established the boards of trustees, that led to a lot of competition between the new uh, leadership, the trustees, the leadership of the trustees, and traditional leaders like uh, clergy or the adjuntos, the the uh, the wise council uh, in the synagogues. Why am I using a Latino word? Because at this time, the majority of established Jewish presence in the U.S. is, of course, Sephardic. We are still prior to major Ashkenazi presence in North America. 
um, and the traditional leaders of these Jewish communities are the adjuntos. Um, by this time, actually, there are also Ashkenazi Jews in America, so don't get me wrong, there are Ashkenazi Jews, and there is Ashkenazi presence also in the congregations, but the structures of the congregations prior to the incorporation is based on Sephardic customs due to the Sephardic uh, leadership in the community. Um, some scholars argue that the incorporation structure also made it impossible for Jewish communities to practice uh, harem, meaning practice excommunication. That's a practice which, which Jewish communities did for centuries, but uh, once they had to abide by American secular uh, norms and laws and regulations surrounding the incorporation of religious communities, they could not practice that uh, traditional just, uh, Jewish custom anymore. And one, one could argue that that's for the best, but um, that's not the conversation I want to have right now. I just want to point to some of the challenges that Jewish communities faced at this point of uh, American history. Um, I also want to point to two dates which are important for our conversation. Um, 1789 is the ratification of the American Constitution, which does not mention religious liberty and does not guarantee religious uh, liberty, but outlaws religious tests as a requirement for public office, which means that theoretically, from that point on, Jews and also other religious minorities were permitted to be elected into public office, which is definitely a first uh, in, in American Jewish history. And two years later, uh, of course, uh, we have to mention the First Amendment, which can be considered a guarantee for religious freedom. Now, that's the context of uh, Jews living in the early American Republic, but today we are you know, focusing on the presidency and uh, Jews, presidency and anti-Semitism and bias. So I wanted to say a few things about Washington, but I think uh, it's more productive if we read something written by Washington or allegedly written by Washington. Some scholars claim this letter was actually written by Jefferson, but uh, I know I was not there. I want to point to a few expressions here in this letter from George Washington to the Hebrew congregation in Newport, Rhode Island. This is a letter which Washington writes after his personal visit to the community. And I will not read out loud the whole letter. Um, if you are interested, I'm happy to send you uh, the slides and the materials. Uh, you can email me. You, you will find my email address on the website of UF. Um, or I can also put it in the chat box. But I just want to point to some of the expressions that Washington uses. And I'm pretty sure that he did not use these expressions by coincidence. First of all, um, he calls Jews as citizens. In the very first, in the very, very first paragraph, he emphasizes that he enjoyed his visit uh, to Newport, where he was received warmly by everybody, by all classes of citizens. And that uh, should also include Jews. He's writing a letter to Jewish leaders. Um, in the third paragraph, which I want to point to, he describes that the policies of the United States of America should serve as an inspiration to the rest of the world. That is, of course, uh, generally the approach of uh, early American leaders. They see their project as an inspiration for other nations to imitate. And Washington writes, and I think this is very interesting, that we don't need toleration, right? Instead of toleration, we need the acknowledgement and the exercise of inherent natural rights. So his argument is that it's not enough. It's not enough to tolerate Jews as the British did during colonial times or um, the Dutch did in the Dutch Republic, for instance, but uh, states should acknowledge the rights of uh, Jewish citizens. Um, however, one might argue that the last bit of the paragraph 
makes this acknowledgement conditional. Um, when Washington writes that uh, these citizens, meaning the Jews, should demean themselves as good citizens, I don't think I don't think personally that Washington considered the Jew citizenship to be conditional. I don't think that he believed in uh, a dichotomy of good minority and bad minority, a good productive minority and a bad lazy minority or whatever. But um, we can see in, 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 in this formulation that he encourages Jews to be good citizens, to see themselves as good citizens and well, maybe to behave as good citizens. Um, and last, I, I wanted to point your attention to the formulation of children of the stock of Abraham. Now, my understanding is that at this time, the term Jew had some pejorative connotations and Jews very often themselves would refrain from using the term Jew to speak about uh, their own identities. Um, and that might be an explanation why Washington uh, uses the term children of the stock of Abraham uh, to describe the Jewish people, um, which would prove that he actually knew uh, about the sensitive sensitivities of this community and cared about it. Now, we'll jump now a few decades. I told you, I'm, my aim is to cover <laughs> everything about presidency and Jews in an hour, so we'll have to jump a lot. We'll now jump a few decades and continue continue with Abraham Lincoln. Um, we can find some, so there are all these personal anecdotes about uh, Lincoln having a very good Jewish friend and having a Jewish photographer and uh, working with Jews. But apart from the personal anecdotes, I, I think what's more interesting for us is the historical proofs uh, for Lincoln's engagement for Jewish emancipation. And we know that it was Lincoln who did lobbying, intense lobbying, uh, to change certain discriminatory laws that prohibited Jews to serve in the US Army as chaplains, for instance. So up until Lincoln, um, only Christian chaplains were, or only Christian uh, clergy members were permitted to serve as chaplains. And it is under Lincoln's leadership that this uh, privilege will be extended to Jewish clergy members as well. And he appoints uh, Rabbi Jacob Frankel, who goes by the title Reverend, so Reverend slash Rabbi Jacob Frankel, of uh, the, the congregation Rodef Shalom in Philadelphia to be the first Jewish military chaplain. Um, he is not the first Jewish military chaplain in history. Uh, there are Jewish military chaplains in the in Austria or the, in the 1840s, but he is the first Jewish military chaplain in the United States, and um, many others will follow in the coming decades and. Uh, up until today. And there, there is another uh, story regarding Lincoln, which I wanted to share with you because I think that also sheds light uh, to his commitment against discrimination. And that's actually connected to his uh, general, Ulysses Grant. Ulysses Grant um, expelled Jews from parts of Tennessee, Mississippi, and Kentucky in 1862 during the civil war when uh, grant occupied parts of these states he issued an order general order number 11, number 11 you can find the text on the slide which expelled jews as a class uh, from these territories he namely associated jews with the confederacy and not only that but accused them of smuggling cotton through uh, the, the territories. He gave the Jews in these districts 24 hours to leave. Uh, many of them did leave, but others protested his uh, order and turned to President Lincoln, who then again made Grant 
uh, change, change his mind and within three weeks uh, Grant uh, issued a new order which which made this one invalid so even though some Jews or have already left by then um, this ish, this uh, this order issued by Ulysses Grant might be the most uh, explicit form of anti-Semitic legislation in United States history. Um, and even though it lasted only for three weeks and only on certain parts of three uh, Confederate states under Unionist uh, occupation, I, I still think we should keep in mind and don't forget about it because it tells us how deeply rooted these anti-Semitic stereotypes were and continue to be, to be as we'll see later. Um, and this is also interesting because Ulysses Grant, as you know, later on becomes president of the United States. And as president, Ulysses Grant does issue presidential condemnations of anti-Semitism in other countries. So even though he expels Jews when uh, he's uh, in Tennessee, Mississippi, and Kentucky in 62, a uh, few decades later, to accord Jewish voters or for whatever reason, he issues presidential declarations condemning anti-Semitism in the Russian Empire. He issues presidential uh, declarations to condemn anti-Semitism in the Kingdom of Romania. But, and um, this is why you can see cartoons like that in, in, the, in the press of the age where they point at the uh double-faced nature of Ulysses Grant's anti-Semitism. On the one on the one hand, you can see the army order number 11. That's the uh you can see that side that text on the tail of the crocodile he is dressed up as because of the crocodile tree tears. And uh on the other hand you can see how he's holding a uh, a, a re press release or a document stating that he is sympathetic with the persecuted Jews in Russia. But what's more important for our uh, purpose is that Lincoln was very straightforward and made Grant change his order and Jews could resettle in uh, these three states. Now, um, Again, jumping a few decades, I, I wanted to speak now about a person who was not a president, but could have been a president, uh, William Jennings Bryan. Uh, William Jennings Bryan was uh, the Democratic Populist Joint Party nominee uh, during the 1896 presidential elec elections. Uh, he lost but he had a very successful uh, presidential campaign. I guess not so successful if he lost, but <laughs> um, scholars of communication, scholars of rhet rhetorics are studying his campaign as a, uh, an excellent example for populist rhetorics in the United States and United States uh, political communication. Now, William Jennings Bryan was also uh, probably the first presidential nominees to use anti-Semitic code words in his campaign. He was not explicitly anti-Semitic, but in uh, many of his speeches, he did refer to anti-Semitic conspiracy myths and used, made use of anti-Semitic code words. Uh, I just also want to point to the historic context, but we are now already at, in the by the late 1800s and uh, it is in this time that more than two million Jews uh, almost three million Jews come to the U.S. which is the largest wave of Jewish migration in history uh, most of them come from Eastern European territories fleeing pogroms uh, terrible economic social conditions uh, mostly from the Russian Empire and they're here to stay. So um, this whole 
Jewish migration, which becomes uh, uh, even more visible by the end of the century, also has an influence on the presidential campaign uh, of William Jennings Bryan, um, who accuses uh, Grover Cleveland, also a member of the Democratic Party, so they are both members of the same party, of selling out the US to the Rothschilds. As you know, the Rothschilds are a, a Jewish, oh, what just happened? Oh. I don't know, check this. Can you can you hear me? Or yes, we hear you fine, Armin. But, so my slides disappeared. I can't see my slides. Can you see my slides? It says pinch out for a larger view. It looks like it's buffering. Maybe okay. you want to stop sharing your screen and then do it again. Okay, that's strange. I'm sorry about that. No, technology can't live with it. Can't live without it. There you go. Does it work now? Okay, is it full screen? Yes, you're fine. Okay, awesome, thank you. So, Rothschilds. Um, as you know, Jewish banking family, they have been active for uh, some centuries now. And at, at a certain time, they were a very influential uh, family, uh, especially in France, uh, parts of present-day Germany and the UK. Um, never really in the US. But due to their influence in uh, European politics, they became a code word for uh, Jewish power, Jewish influence on politics, uh, also among uh, American anti-Semites. And when it turns, turned out that uh, Cleveland, uh, President Cleveland, had an agreement with J.P. Morgan and the Rothschilds were somehow also involved in that agreement, uh, this was used by William Jennings Bryan to uh, accuse Cleveland of setting out the country and especially the U.S. Treasury to the Rothschilds and foreign interests. Um, I, I want to note that William Jennings Bryan, of course, uh, refused to be labeled as an anti-Semite, and he explicitly looked to speak to Jews as well. So he, so he also delivered speeches in front of Jewish audiences, and he claimed that Jews should know best that Cleveland is not a good president for them because what he is doing is not in the interest of the Jewish people either. And I want to uh, refer to the so-called cross of gold speech where uh, William Jennings Bryan depicted the American people as Jesus who is being crucified uh, by Rothschilds and Cleveland. And I actually have a cartoon uh, for you. You can see how America, personified by uh, Uncle Sam, is being crucified by Wall Street pirates. Of course, these so-called Wall Street pirates are depicted with uh, traditional anti-Semitic uh, characteristics. And you can also see President uh, Cleveland on the right side and a uh, representative of the, Repu the Republican Party, James Blaine, who are together uh, accused of uh, crucifying uh, America, Uncle Sam. So even though um, uh, Jennings Bryan did not win the election, I, I think it's uh, worthwhile talking about him because he led a pretty popular uh, nominee campaign, and um, he was the presidential candidate for one of the two major parties. I also supported by a third party, the Populist Party. Now, as we move on and forward in history, I, I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about the me melting pot model, a model of ethnic integration that was endorsed by political and cultural elite of uh, the early 1900s, uh, in particular by Presidents Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. Um, the melting pot model has the assumption that if many cultures, ethnicities come together, they will form something new 
which is good for everybody. That's the assumption uh, behind this model of ethnic integration. Um, but at the same time of uh, embracing this melting pot model that should be in theory good for everybody, many of the people behind it had open resentments against certain ethnicities. And I want to point to Woodrow Wilson, who was a, a staunch advocate for the melting pot model, but also said that uh, so South, Southern European and Eastern European immigrants in the US are un-American because they will not integrate. Um, he, in particular, criticized Catholic immigrants, but um, of course, uh, his criticism was also applied to Jews by others, not by Woodrow Wilson himself. Um, and to refer to some of our most uh, brightest uh, Jewish intellectuals of the era found that the melting pot model was not challenging uh, Anglo-Protestant hegemony. It, they argued that the melting pot model basically is just a form of assimilation, meaning Jews and other ethnic religious minorities are expected to assimilate, to give up their cultural uh, identities, their cultural norms, their cultural traits, and uh, follow everything what the majority says. So it is also the time of intellectuals like philosopher and Rabbi Mordecai Kaplan, or Rabbi and author activist Judah Magnus, Rabbi Bernard Ravel, or activist author Henrietta Sold. It's a time when many of these American Jewish intellectuals, um, all of them first or second generation immigrants from Europe, are trying to come up with a new form of Judaism that works for America of the 20th century, early 20th century. Um, it's the time of the birth of modern orthodoxy in an American context, uh, cultural Zionism, a lot of interesting things are happening as a reaction to uh, the mel melting pot. Jews are recreating their whole, a whole new Jewish identity uh, amidst this pressure. So there is something good to uh, pressure coming from the top, I guess. Um, I don't know if anybody here has seen the, the movie Hester Street. I think it's an excellent uh, movie about Jewish assimilation in the early 1900s or maybe late 1800s. I'm actually not sure if it's defined which year the movie is set in. Um, there is a scene I just wanted to share with you today. It's just two minutes. You can see how an assimilated Jewish man encounters his uh, wife and son who just arrived from Eastern Europe in uh, Ellis Island. It's a lovely scene. And I just realized that I was, I'm not sharing my sound. So I have to do that again. Hope it will work.
For what purpose are you bringing this woman in? For what purpose are you bringing this woman in? For the paper, she's my wife. And that's your son? <laughs> What's this doing, man? Chad. This, this woman is my wife and that's all. Okay. Um, in case you haven't seen the movie yet, I, I recommend it to all of you. I think it uh, shows well the tensions uh, between Jews who had, had lived in the U.S. for already some time and these newcomers. Um, questions around assimilation versus integration, how to be part of a country where you are a minority. Can you keep and maintain some of your traditions or, or none of them? Uh, it's a great movie. Last, uh, no, we are not last yet, but I also wanted to, so, so far we've been focusing on presidents or one person who was running to be president. Uh, now I just wanted to mention two people who were not presidents, but were very close to presidents and whose agenda and program might have influenced presidents or at least some legislators. Uh, the first one is uh, Madison Grant. Those of you who are um, interested in white supremacy or research on white supremacy, um, in case you haven't read Madison Grant yet, uh, you should do it because he was uh, the author of uh, the 1916 bestseller, The Passing of the Great Race. He basically argued that uh, Americans should let in only Nord or that the Nordic race, meaning white Europeans from Northern Europe are more superior than others, uh, including Jews. He's, he propagates uh, uh, um, uh, race theory. Uh, we, he, did, he doesn't invent it, but he's somebody who ma makes it uh, mainstream in uh, America. Um, he's a close ally and friend of uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Um, and Roosevelt is the same person who advocates for the melting pot model, if you remember. Now, Madison Grant um, doesn't only write about um, racial hierarchies. He actively advocates for quotas on immigrants coming from non-Nordic countries, which in effect means that he wants to restrict immigrants coming from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe. Um, and as we'll soon see, he was very successful. He was officially an advisor on an act that uh, eventually ended Jewish immigration to the United States. He supplied data to uh, finalize that act. We are going to speak more about the Immigration Act of 1924 in a bit. Um, and apart from that, um, he was also very active in passing laws uh, prohibiting uh, marriage between black and white people, for instance, or, or, or the so-called Racial Integrity Act of 1924, which established the one drop rule in Virginia or codified it, at least. So Madison Grant would be also a person to keep in mind when we talk about uh, the American political establishment and uh, Jewish communities. And I also want to spend just a minute uh, with Henry Ford. Um, Henry Ford was a uh, supporter, supporter of Woodrow Wilson. So again, the melting another advocate for the melting pot model. Um, he ran, uh, Henry Ford ran as a candidate for the Senate seat in Michigan, but lost to a Republican challenger. And he even considered running for president in 1924. And you can see a, uh, uh, a pin that was used by his supporters for his presidential campaign, but he eventually did not run for president. 
Um, and Henry Ford is, of course, uh, a very important promoter of anti-Semitic conspiracy myths in the United States, as you probably already heard. He was the public, the owner of the Dearborn Independent, which was a newspaper that dedicated many articles, including some articles written by Henry Ford to anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. Um, he, uh, Henry Ford, wrote uh, a series of publications called The International Jew, where he repeated some of the claims made by uh, other anti-Semitic uh, works such as the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, um, of an alleged Jewish conspiracy against uh, Christian traditional values and America and Jews controlling the media and the banks, so the usual stuff. Uh, it shouldn't come as a coincidence that Hitler actually mentions Henry Ford as a leader of <laughs> a growing anti-Jewish movement. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a compliment if Hitler says something good about you. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be happy. But uh, either way, Henry Ford uh, did not end up, he, he did not run, end up running for president in 1924. But as we can see, he was uh, an ally of a president. And he actually ran for the Michigan Senate seat um, because Woodrow Wilson encouraged him to do so. So I, I already brought up the so-called immigration quotas, um, because in my opinion, this is something we don't talk about enough and underestimate how important it's, this was from a Jewish, uh, from perspective of Jewish history. These are, these two acts were uh, signed by President Warren Harding in 1921 and the extended version from 1924 by Calvin Coolidge. Um, essentially, these immigration quota acts reduced immigration coming from uh, Eastern Europe. Um, and by the by 1924, they virtually ended Jewish immigration, which has which had been content uh, constant for more than a century uh, by then. And these immigration quota acts were not lifted prior to the 1960s. And in case you ever wondered why the U.S. did not did not accept Jewish refugees coming from Europe uh, during the Holocaust, uh, that's due to these immigration quota acts, partially, not only because of that, but partially. Um, we know that um, many, many Jews, hundreds of thousands of Jews from Germany and also from other European countries applied for refugee status in the U.S. and they were declined. Uh, in part due to these uh, immigration quotas, which were introduced under the presidentship, uh, uh, the presidency of Warren, Warren Harding and then Calvin Coolidge, and which were not changed by uh, FDR. Uh, that's not the only reason why the US did not accept refugees from Europe, but it's one of the technical uh, reasons. And finally, I wanted to look at anti-Semitism after the Second World War. Um, after the revelations about the Holocaust, anti-Semitism, of course, becomes a taboo, and there is no uh, president or presidential nominee who will uh, openly endorse an anti-Semitic point of view. Um, but that doesn't mean that anti-Semitism disappeared. Anti-Semitism has been around for 2000 years, I don't think that it disappeared at any point. Um, and I just brought to you two examples for anti Semitism scandals uh, in the US in connection to presidents after World War II. The first one is probably the more famous one. Um, the Watergate tapes revealed that Nixon actually made numerous anti Semitic remarks. Uh, during his presidency, um, which is especially uh, interesting, uh, cons you know, if we consider that he worked uh, so closely with Kissinger, but um, these comments are on record. And I also wanted to bring up uh, uh, George Brown, who was uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff under President Ford. 
who also made anti-Semitic remarks repeatedly, not only once, but are, uh, these are on record at least on two different occasions. And um, many, uh, many demanded Ford to rebuke Brown for these remarks, but he did not do so. Um, and my slides don't go any further. Uh, that's intentional. I think I think that there have been further anti-Semitic remarks made by presidents or by people uh, in the White House since Gerald Ford. And I think that that will happen also in the future, unfortunately. Um, but I did not want to reduce our conversation to current political events because I think that the pro problem is really deeply rooted and it's a uh, much bigger problem than just current political debates relating to certain figures who are right now active in the political arena. So I will I will close my uh, presentation with some of the sources I used. Um, thank you for listening. Hope I could share some new information with you. And uh, I look forward to the questions, discussions. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Armin, Professor Lange, thank you so much. I'm going to run, launch the poll because because this is research and, and grant connected and all of my academics in there uh, know about this. Um, so if you wouldn't, it wouldn't mind taking a second, just answering, does anybody have a question? If you'd like to raise your hand. Uh, if anybody would like to raise their hand. Um, Linda, this is Stuart Cohen. I can't seem to uh, raise my hand, but I have a picture here. I don't okay, know because do I like you, Stu. And you yeah. didn't get COVID, then you can uh, you can ask a question. Go ahead. <laughs> thank you, thank you for that. Uh, thank you, uh, Armin. Really enjoyed that presentation. One president that you didn't mention was Harry Truman, and I don't know that he is given enough credit by the Jewish community for the recognition of the state of Israel because he was that recognition was against the very strong advice of the Secretary of State and the entire State Department. He was a loner on that one. And I believe that we were the second country to recognize Israel, which was very, very material at that point. So in the litany of presidents, I think that Harry Truman deserves, deserves a word with respect to the Jewish community. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, right. I'm sure there's also more to mention. Um, but yeah, thank you for adding that. Yeah. Is any of the, oh, wait, do we have, let's see, there's something in chat. You put that in chat. Um, Professor Langer has put his email. If you want uh, to see the slides, he would be happy to share it with you. I don't see any hands up, but if anybody doesn't know how to raise their little yellow or brown hand, then um, please unmute yourself and ask a question now. Anybody have any questions? If not, then it is just about 8.30 and I'm going to thank Professor Langer. He will be back, by the way, in lecture, let's see, where are we? One, two, three, four, five. Our fifth lecture in April, he's going to be giving a lecture on fighting Islamophobia and understanding Muslims because we are going to address Islam and Christianity a little bit later on. And uh, we're trying to cover a wide range of uh, religious topics, not just uh, Judaism. Um, just so you know, Armin, um, uh, yours is a good lead-in. It's it's going to be a while, but Rachel Gordon is going to be doing a lecture in, in the end of April on religion and, and American culture, 1940s anti-Semitism literature. So I will make sure you have the complete rundown. I thought you did. Uh, with that, everybody, thank you so much for joining in. Uh, if you don't receive our weekly Shabbat Shalom, then please reach out to me. I put my email at the beginning, uh, lynda at jcncf.org, although I think you can also find it probably from any of the Zoom links that you received. And thank you. And we'll see you in two weeks for on February 15th for American Religion, the Forefathers, the Colonists, and our Judeo-Christian Roots with Professor Ken Wald. Uh, thank you, everybody, and have a great night. And thank you, Armin. I will talk to you. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Great and I'll, se I'll send out the recording to everybody that registered. Bye, everyone. <laughs>